Hello, welcome to episode 109 of the Henry George Daily Devotional. We continue reading Progress and Poverty and Inquiry into the Cause of Industrial Depressions and the Increase of Want with the Increase of Wealth. The Remedy, published in 1879 by Henry George. Uh, I think he pretty much self-published, actually. We are in Book 10, The Law of Human Progress, Chapter 3, also named The Law of Human Progress. This is, uh, we're halfway through the, uh, the chapter. There are two qualities of human nature which it will be well wait to a halt wait this is where we stopped to trace to its highest expression the law which thus operates to evolve with progress the force which stops progress uh, would be it seems to me to go far to the solution of a deeper problem than that of the genesis of the material universe the problem of the genesis of evil. Interesting. What's a bigger deal? Where, uh, you know, the Big Bang, figuring out how that works. Figuring out where evil comes from. <laughs> Which stops, stops societal progress. George writes, Let me content myself with pointing out the manner in which as society develops... There arise tendencies which check development. There are two qualities of human nature which it will be well, however, first to call to mind. The one is the power of habit, the tendency to continue to do things in the same way. The other is the possibility of mental and moral deterioration. The effect of the first so in social development is to continue habits, customs, laws, and methods long after they have lost their original usefulness. And the effect of the other is to permit the growth of institutions and modes of thought from which the normal perceptions of men instinctively revolt. So there's habit. All right, this is all just the first effect, habit. Oh, no. The effect of the other is to permit... Oh, moral deterioration is the... It's habit and moral deterioration. Mm. Now, the growth and development of society not merely tend to make each more and more dependent upon all and to lessen the influence of individuals even over their own conditions as compared with the influence of society, but the effect of association or integration is to give rise to a collective power which is distinguishable from the sum of individual powers. Mm, the collective power. Analogies, or perhaps rather illustrations of the same law, may be found in all directions. As animal organisms increase in complexity, there arise above the life and the power of the parts a life and power of the integrated whole. Above the capability of involuntary movements, the capability of voluntary movements. The actions and impulses of bodies of men are, as has often been observed, different from those which under the same circumstances would be called forth in individuals. Yes, groups and individuals. Tricky. The wisdom of crowds versus the madness of crowds. Speaking of such a thing, did everybody read Terry Baricious's Democracy Without Elections new post today? I did. Oh. Oh, this is his, um, not a sub stack. Uh, 
wonder how you get from here to a substack. democracycreative.substack.com This is his new This is his new um chapter read it and weep Somewhere in there he talks about the mad somewhere in that blog he talks about the madness of crowds versus the wisdom of crowds <clears throat> The fighting qualities of a regiment may be very different from those of the individual soldiers, but there is no need of illustrations. In our inquiries into the nature and rise of rent, we trace the very thing to which I allude. Where population is sparse, land has no value. Just as men congregate together, the value of land appears and rises, a clearly distinguishable thing from the values produced by individual effort. Yeah, I was talking to somebody about Georgism. Um, what was their exact question? I guess they were sort of asking about like that value that goes into land, like the excess value created in a trade. I don't remember their question, which makes it hard to talk about. But it was something about either why should that excess value not go to the people who are doing the... Uh, okay, I sort of remember. Uh, if, somebody, if some people come along and, and invest a bunch of capital in building up a town, why shouldn't they be the ones to... Um, to claim the land value that arises. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, the land value, like, I think this is sort of related to that in that, um, uh, You know, the value produced from the individual effort of, uh, I don't know, making a, or start building a farm and then harvesting a bunch of uh, production, produce, like that's clearly the result of your individual effort. Um, if there's nowhere else for people to build a farm, then the value of that spot has been created by other people wanting. This is not a great example of society increasing the value of that land. This is more of just there being a scarcity. The value of that land going up as a function of a bunch of people living around it, um, you know, that's due to, to both the farmer originally settling there and it's due to the other people settling nearby it's not clear exactly if each well it's definitely not true that each person individually contributes exactly the same amount to the societal value generated uh, but it would be very difficult indeed to try to decide how much each person does contribute to society um, I don't know, I guess you can make an argument that the general wealth they produce actually reflects how much they contribute to society. But that's... Uh, I'm not sure about that. Giving, it's easy, it definitely is sort of functionally easier to assume that everyone just sort of equally does it. So we equally return the citizen's dividend. Anyway. Hmm. Uh, a value which springs from association, which increases as association grows greater and disappears as association is broken up. It does seem right. 
it does seem I would agree that it is clear to distinguish the the between value created from individual effort and value created by association. I don't know. It's easier when you have concrete examples, I think. And the same thing is true of power and other forms than those generally expressed in terms of wealth. Now, as society grows, the disposition to continue previous social adjustments tends to lodge this collective power as it arises in the hands of a portion of community. And this unequal distribution of the wealth and power gained as society advances tends to produce greater inequality. Since aggression shows by what it feeds on, and the idea of justice is blurred by the habitual toleration of injustice. Hmm. Yeah, this dilemma of progress not being equal, however it does arise, does create this incentivization problem. This is some one of the big re another big reason that establishing a social convention of sortition seems more promising of long-term georgism whereas you get the land value tax temporarily or you get the land value tax but your social conventions are to elect leaders through electoral politics well, you're still going to end up electing a wealthy minority, a wealthy, powerful minority, who's going to have a strong incentive to ensure they continue being a wealthy minority and maybe don't care too much about the other people. In this way, the patriarchal organization of society can easily grow into hereditary monarchy. All right, we are not going to make it through this chapter. A hereditary monarchy, in which the king is as a god on earth and the masses of the people mere slaves of his caprice. It is natural that the father should be the directing head of the family and that at his death the eldest son, as the oldest and most experienced member of the little community, should succeed to the headship. But to continue this arrangement as the family expands is to lodge power in a particular line. And the power thus lodged necessarily continues to increase as the common stock becomes larger and larger and the power of the community grows. The head of the family passes into the hereditary king who comes to look upon himself and to be looked upon by others as a being of superior rights. With the growth of the collective power as compared with the power of the individual, his power to reward and to punish increases and so increase the inducements to flatter and to fear him. Until finally, if the process be not disturbed, a nation grovels at the foot of a throne and a hundred thousand men toil for fifty years to prepare a tomb for one of their own mortal kind. You know, it genuinely is weird to me to think of men as the head of their family. I really... I like... The only families that had the father as the head, in my experience, were like... I don't know. Definitely more the more extreme homeschool families that I knew... I I don't know. I mean, maybe it's... Yeah, I guess some of my friends... Yeah, I can think of a few younger ones, but I don't... 
Yeah, any of the families I grew up with. I guess a few. No, I can think of, I don't know. 50-50. That's not, I don't know. So the war chief of a little band of savages is but one of their number, whom they follow as their bravest and most wary. But when large bodies come to act together, personal selection becomes more difficult, a blinder obedience becomes necessary and can be enforced. And from the very necessities of warfare, when conducted on a large scale, absolute power arises. This is, uh, sounds like some of the struggles of uh, electoral politics. And so of the specialization of function. There is a manifest gain in productive power when social growth has gone so far that instead of pro every producer being summoned from his work for fighting purposes, a regular military force can be specialized. But this inevitably tends to the co concentration of power in the hands of the military class or their chiefs. The preservation of internal order, the administration of justice, the construction and care of public works, and notably the observances of religion, all tend in a similar, in similar manner to pass into the hands of special classes whose disposition is to magnify their function and extend their power. So in some of these cases, uh, I could see people wanting to argue, well, that's interesting. None of these cases were about industry, public works, religion, military. Uh, you know, the, the little libertarian in me would argue that if we're talking about business sizes and industry, it would be competition that... Uh, constrains the kind of um, badly functioning organizations, which you would hope those are sort of the less good, less just organizations, essentially, the ones who are providing less value to society. And then certain industries, just by the nature of their production pipeline, would sort of, that would sort of determine the best size for them to operate at. Whereas uh, public works, military, well, I mean, military would be sort of constrained at some point by a kind of competition. And I suppose you could argue religion also is in competition with other religions, but it is definitely true that when we give religion and religious land a uh, certain kind of financial bet pro benefits, you know, the nonprofit status and what other whatever other subsidies they receive probably distorts the religion. George goes on, I guess we will too, but the great cause of inequality is in the natural monopoly, which is given by the possession of land. The first perceptions of men seem always to be that land is common property, which we've talked about here, I suppose. But the rude devices by which this is at first recognized, such as annual partitions or cultivations in common, are consistent with only a low stage of development. The idea of property which naturally arises with reference to things of human production is easily transferred to land, and an institution with which, when population is sparse, merely secures to the improver and the user the due reward of his labor. Finally, as population becomes dense and rent arises, operates to strip the producer of his wages. Not merely this, but the appropriation of rent for public purposes, which is the only way in which, with anything like a high development, land can be readily retained as common property. Becomes, when political and religious power passes into the hands of a class, the ownership of the land by that class and the rest of the community become merely tenants. 
and wars and conquests which tend to the concentration of political power and to the institution of slavery naturally result, where social growth has given land a value in the appropriation of the soil. A dominant class who concentrate power in their hands will likewise soon concentrate ownership of the land. To them will fall large partitions of conquered land, which the former inhabitants will till as will till as tenants or serfs, and the public domain or common lands, which in the natural course of social growth are left for a while in every country, and in which state the primitive system of village, culture, leaves, pasture, and woodland are readily acquired, as we see by modern instances. And inequality once established, the ownership of land tends to concentrate as development goes on. Mainly a tennis over the zone, yeah. So this is how the inequality seeps in. And is that even avoidable? I don't know. All right, well. See you next time.